welcome everybody to the Open Education Network Summit. Thank you for joining us for today's session, Too Many Spreadsheets, Relational Databases for Open Education Program Data Collection and Reporting. My name is Barb Thies, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the community manager here at the Open Education Network. If you're not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher education organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu slash OEN. And before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which, <clears throat> excuse me, we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Please feel free to acknowledge the Indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. I will be handing it off to Amanda Larson from The Ohio State University, a member of the Summit Planning Committee, who will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Thanks, Barb. As we begin the session, we'd like to share a few important details with you. The webinar is being recorded. For that reason, you have been muted. The video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. I'm going to drop a link to that in chat. The last 20 minutes of today's session will be for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will not have a chance to ask all of the questions to presenters, but we will try our best. The chat will be a space to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu slash summit community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. The hashtag for the summit is hashtag OEN Summit 21. Join us on Twitter at OpenEd underscore network. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters. We are joined today by Amy Hooper from Lynn Benton Community College, Abby Elder from Iowa State University, Tracy Hope from Brown Hope, Daisy Marias from California State University East Bay, Sophie Rondu from Viva, Dave Ernst from the OEN, and Scott Ross also from Viva. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to the presenters. All right, hello everyone. One second while I share my screen. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see this. I can see it, go ahead. All right, good. So hello everyone and welcome to our panel presentation, Too Many Spreadsheets, Relational Databases for Open Education uh, Program Data Collection and Reporting. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but we'll make it through it. So my name is Abby Elder. I'm the Open Access and Librarian at Iowa State University, and I'll be the facilitator for today's panel, which basically means I'll run the slides and do a bit of a quick introduction for us. So moving on, uh, I know we just had a land acknowledgement, but we've got quite a few people from all over the US here today. So quickly, I'd like to acknowledge the land upon which our panelists are speaking today. This land acknowledgement has been adapted from the William and Mary University's land acknowledgement to reflect the many peoples whose lands we are inhabiting today. Though I will also note that this acknowledgement is not sufficient to truly reflect the diversity of these peoples and their ways of life. Our panelists acknowledge the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands on which we reside today and pay our respect to their tribal members past and present. These include the Meskwaki and Sauk nations of Iowa, the Clackamas, Cowlitz, Cascades, and Confederated tribes of Grand Ronde in Portland, Oregon, the Chero and Haka, uh, Nottoway, Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Matapani, Monacan, Nansimond, Nottoway, Pamunkey, Potomac, Upper Matapani, and Rappahannock, uh, and other currently unrecognized tribes of Virginia, and the Mueca Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. It's not enough to really get the acknowledgement across, but we hope that by acknowledging all of these peoples, we can at least put forward 
the bare minimum for their peoples uh, and the land that we all live on today. So moving on, uh, how did we get here? Now, I'm not going to be presenting a tool or database for you all today, but I'm going to start off our discussion with a short overview of the problem that brings us here. Our presentation today, Too Many Spreadsheets, refers to a common problem in OER programming. When you try to collect different types of data, student enrollment numbers, textbook costs, workshop attendance, grades, and in the process of documenting all of this data, the actual impact of your program gets lost. Some of you might have different problems related to program data. Perhaps you're having a difficult time getting any data about the impact of your work together. Perhaps you have too much data to sift through. Or perhaps, like many of our participants today, you have a lot of data that's unstructured or difficult to standardize, if that's even possible. Our panelists have each encountered unique challenges when it comes to documenting and supporting their open education programs through data, and each will be discussing a process they've developed or implemented to work through these issues. Before we move on, I do want to acknowledge that data points can't tell us everything about our work. The ways we interpret and collect data will greatly affect what we find, first of all, as will our expectations. Our discussion today will not be telling you how to definitively measure the impact of your OER program. However, some examples, having these examples, can help us more efficiently support our communities. So I hope that this work that our panelists are sharing today will be useful to you in that regard. Now, please join me in welcoming our first panelist, Amy Hofer, who will be discussing the work that Open Oregon has done to structure their OER programs data. Thanks, Abby. So um, I'm just going to give a little overview of where we started. So let's go to the next slide, which um, has a picture of the approximate number of spreadsheets that I'm trying to get away from, which is like a zillion. Um, and I, I have to say, I identify as an experiential learner. So I had to try every single one of these things that I ended up not doing. Um, so um, also some folks that are here may have seen the messages that I sent to the three OER listservs. Um, and I got a lot of responses back, like I have a similar question, but no solution at the moment. So um, that was actually really, helpful information to hear and it also helped me connect with all of the panelists that are here today. So I'm really grateful to our welcoming and warm OER networks um, for you know being a resource for me. Um, I explored um, the software options that were available to me as a Mac user that I was able to identify. So including Tableau, Microsoft Access, SQL, and LibreOffice Base. None of those worked for me for a variety of reasons. And I landed on um, setting up a free Airtable account so that I could test that solution. Um, and I was like, okay, I see a lot of potential here. Um, we did wind up with a pro account for Open Oregon Educational Resources, but the fact that I was able to start with a free account and I could start like putting data in right away and playing with it. Um, help me sort of understand why it might work. But then I started running into um, getting stuck with advanced functionality to link my tables and I would like email their customer support. And sometimes it was a helpful person and sometimes it might've been an AI instead and not a person. So anyway, I reached out to a local nonprofit that I have volunteered with that I know uses Airtable on their back end. And I was able to hire Tracy as a contractor. She works for that nonprofit. So you'll hear from Tracy in just a minute. But um, the reason that I kind of landed on Airtable as um, the thing that seemed most promising for my needs is um, that first of all, I was able to try it. Um, and also, I'm really comfortable with spreadsheets. I'm really used to using them. And Airtable pretty much looks like a spreadsheet with some additional database functionality. Um, and so for that reason, it was sort of more intuitive for me to be able to jump in and start using it. So now I'm going to hand over to Daisy for a little bit more about how she's using Airtable. Um, and then we'll also have Tracy talk about how Open Oregon wound up using Airtable. So take it away, Daisy. Thank you. Yeah, so I was one of those folks that answers uh, Amy's call on more information about Airtable because I had already been using it and I was like, hey, I've been toying around in that space too. Uh, but like Amy, I also am just creating spreadsheets and spreadsheets. I'm the new equity and open access librarian at Cal State East Bay. I started in the middle of this 
ongoing global pandemic and at home trying to figure out where I was, how I was situated and how to organize all this bits of information, Airtable came out very useful. I had her learn from hobbyists actually who were organizing their knitting projects, keeping supplies inventory, tracking vendor listings. Um, and, and as Amy listed, it's, it's really a familiar spreadsheet type of format that it's a little better than that. It's a linked relational database and it's really awesome to be able to have something connect, make connections for you. Uh, so next slide, please, actually. So I started using Airtable to help me organize all this information. It's like, okay, I'm making new connections in my new role as the open access equity person. And I, I need to figure out who are my connections, who are these associations, these all these campus groups. Um, I was not only creating a lot of spreadsheets, but also a lot of notes, so a lot of Google files, a lot of calendar events. And I was like, okay, this is like a lot of stuff related to similar things that I wanna have in one space, but I want stuff to be connected. Um, and I want things to be kind of like, okay, how do I resort and organize to be able to see this in different ways? How do I see the relationships? And so my notes, I, I was like, okay, I could use this Airtable tool to also put links to my notes. Um, and in this way can also use it as a, not only as a CRM, as a personal CRM, um, but also as a project management tool. So I'm like, okay, I could fiddle around with here. I'm like, um, hands on moving things around really quickly with a free trial. I, I started off with a pro trial because Airtable allows you to, gives you access to the pro trial uh, for two, no, maybe, I don't know how long, but it, a set amount of time, but I'm using the free account and it's been working out for me so far to be able to pilot um, these, these types of different situations that I'm finding myself in within the, the information. Um, and I'm also able to invite colleagues to collaborate and, and be more transparent about the progress of some of my outreach and some of my um, ideas, et cetera. And so really I, with Airtable, I'm creating this knowledge base for myself of the connections, interactions, of the, the, the ideas and projects that I'm, I'm putting around um, the OER projects that I want to uh, put forward at my campus. And the image there really is just like, okay, this chaos of information, um, it's called Rising from the Network um, by Cogdog Blog. Um, and so it's just like, okay, you see all these little bits of, of, of these points coming up from the grass, this, this chaotic type of information. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so what I'm trying to do is making sense of the information with Airtable. Um, and what I really have enjoyed about this process of trying to put in all this information that kind of floats in my head or floats online or in my on my email, in my calendar, is to figure out what do I really already know. Um, and I think the process of generating all these different categories and buckets in Airtable, and you'll see in the background there, it's a, it's a preview of, of the database I've created I'm, I'm tracking interactions, I'm tracking projects, tasks, people, groups, communities, academic departments, communication channels, and a resource bank. And this is all information that I know I have somewhere in my mind, in my email, in my calendar, et cetera. And so it really forces me to organize it a bit more. Um, and, and what do I really wanna find out? What am I really trying to track? And what's the purpose of these categories? Why am I trying to track all of this? So the, the process of doing this on my own and trying to piece it together really helps you recognize the need of uh, creating these buckets of information. Next slide, please. Um, and so slowly through this process, um, I am getting more organized. Um, I am seeing uh, the value of having, instead of bookmarks and like, reading lists and tabs, stuff is all in one place. Um, so this is just another preview of one of the, the pages on my um, on this outreach and engagement template that I've created. Next slide. And so if the data could talk, um, and if you could click through a little bit, there's a few more images that pop up. Um, you know, I, I'm seeing that across all these different spreadsheets, I can link the uh, the data on these different spreadsheets together. And so in my project management uh, workflow that I've created in this space, um, I can pull information from my resources bank, for example, and link it to a specific project. 
Um, and so I think slowly and through the different views that Airtable provides, I can see this potential of like, okay, I don't have to repeat this. I've already done this before. Um, and I know what tools I used last time. So it's a really, uh, it's been a really cool tool for me to not being on site and not having met a lot of folks in person to kind of see already these connections in a different way, creating that serendipity that sometimes happens when you run into someone and being like, oh, hey, remember that awesome idea that we had? Like I could kind of sort of in a weird way recreate that in this space. Um, so as a person who is completely new to my institution, I've really appreciated that potential of just recognizing relationships and connections. Um, and so if the data was talking to me, um, I, you know, this relational database allows, has more of that. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. And so I think this is more for me to, to be here in this space is to show that it's really doable. It's something that um, if you're a hands-on person, you can dip your hands in and, and build something on your own, or you can start off from a template. There's a lot of templates out there. And I've actually created a template from the database that I'm using for tracking my own um, OER projects. And so folks are more than welcome to uh, make a copy of that and, and download a version of that and, and modify it and go with it. Cause it's, it's a really, um, it, it's, you can modify it. That's the beauty of some of these tools. It's like, you have a lot of control over what you wanna see. And I will share that in the chat. Um, but that is all, at least for my snippet. Thank you. Oh, and Tracy, I would like to invite Tracy to come up next. All right, thank you very much. Um, getting myself set up here. Okay, so thank you so much for that introduction to Airtable, Daisy. Uh, that's really, you, you just covered a lot of features that I won't need to talk about now. <laughs> so as a, a next example, I'm going to explain a bit about how we're using Airtable as an option for storing and reporting on information for the OER projects. Uh, my name is Tracy Mihok. I do a lot of work with data and operations, and I have a professional background working with education products and services. So this was a really, really fun project to work on. I met Amy through a nonprofit where we were both working and started working on this Airtable project a few months ago. Could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So one of our issues with this, this project was that there was just so much information and we needed to deal with hundreds of records that needed to be uploaded or pasted or copied or however they needed to get into the system together. And this required us to make sure that uh, the spreadsheet information could be uploaded in a consistent format, that the data would be cleaned um, and comparable across different records. But when it comes to having a huge amount of information, one of the things that's really useful is that a lot of the same data relationship principles will apply, whether you're working with a smaller amount of information or whether you're working with uh, a much larger amount of information. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we can document and represent relationships between data and hopefully this will help you with some of your own projects. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that's really, really useful for documenting and representing relationships is something called an entity relationship diagram. And I'm going to talk about this because it was really helpful for us to sort of sift out our own understanding of the information and also for communicating that information with other people. So we'll do a few examples really quick. The diagram itself is very easy to understand, but it's the process of making it and representing it that I think is, is most useful. So what we're showing here is when we're working with types of data, we usually have two different kinds of entities or objects that we're working with. And then there's a relationship between them. And what I'm showing on the bottom is that the kinds of relationships that we care about are typically a one to none, like it maps to nothing on that side or a one to one relationship or a one to many relationships. So these are the kinds that we usually care about. And we'll do a few examples. Next slide, please. All right, so for our first example, um, this is a one-to-one -one relationship where we've got people and we've got library cards. So if we're going to make a database representing people and their library cards, we would expect each person to have one library card. And we would also expect each library card to be connected to one person. Sure, other people might use the card, but it's just that one person who's going to get the late fees. So that's, that's our one-to-one -one relationship there. Next slide, please. Yes. 
Um, so our next one is if we've got trees and apples, clearly a tree doesn't have to produce apples. It might produce zero apples, or it could produce one, or it could produce a lot. But because it, there is that possible one to a lot situation, this is also a one to many relationship. We see that there's sort of a natural relationship arising here. And one more example, yes. So this one was especially useful for us. Uh, we actually use this example in understanding how we were looking up information from one table and gathering it and calculating it and representing it in another. I'll show that a bit more later. But here we've got a representation of the relationship between a big fish which can eat small fish. And notably, a small fish cannot be eaten by more than one big fish. And this was helpful for us in adding up small amounts of information and knowing where to represent them according to the relationship between the tables. Uh, these relationships are pretty easy because they make sense and they describe things that we've seen and observed before. It's easy to think about trees and apples and fish. But sometimes when you're dealing with invisible or abstract things, it can be a lot more difficult to represent that relationship. So thinking these through and actually literally drawing them out or representing them to others can really, really help make sense. Um, it, it makes things more clearer or it might be able to help you pinpoint where there's a problem. If you're not sure how to draw that relationship, it might be that that's the thing that needs some more definition or some more thinking. Next slide, please. Thank you. So let's look at how these relationships might apply when we're looking at our actual program tracking information. Um, this is I, it's a simplified entity relationship diagram here. Um, it's especially simplified because it's not capturing absolutely everything that's happening in our database, but it is something that I thought would be a helpful representation just for the sake of discussion. Um, I represented each table and sort of looking like a folder. So each table, each folder is a different entity that is capturing information in a, a different way. We've got a programs entity on the top left, and we've got activities and project courses, um, each of which sort of contain each other. And then we've also got the relationship where activities can be led by faculty members. Also project courses can be taught by faculty members. So we're being explicit about that relationship between these different types of data objects. Um, the bullet points in each folder are representing what we call attributes. So that's just some details about that specific kind of data entity. Uh, similar to being explicit about the relationships, listing out the attributes can also help you understand what entities should go together. Maybe they actually just all have the same attributes and they ought to be the same thing. Or maybe you realize that some of the attributes are kind of different and maybe these things deserve to be separate entities and have their own separate tables. Um, so next slide, yes. So what we're building up to here is, is once we have these relationships between the objects in our database established, that also really helps us understand how the information can flow through the, the objects as they're all connected together. Because we need to be careful about where we're inputting information and then where we're expecting the information to be output, where we want to report on our information from. So as a very brief example here, um, what we want to do is report on uh, textbook savings at the institution level, but that information is not in the institution's table. That information is captured in the textbook savings, which I've highlighted in the bottom left area. So how do we get that information into the institution's table? Well, because we understand that we have a one-to-many, or if I'm reading from left to right here, a many-to-one relationship between the project courses and the institutions, then that helps us understand that we can, we can sort of gather up all that information into the institutions. Um, next slide, yes. So now we've got our little fish and our big fish relationship represented here. And now we can just look for Airtable features and calculations that will help us put those textbook savings together, roll them up into the institutions table. Um, we can do this, so there's a specific feature in Airtable using links, which, which Daisy was showing before, and there's also a roll-up feature or lookup features, which will help you calculate or gather all those things together into one place. Next slide, please. So this is what that actually looks like in Airtable if you've got um, one of these linking, uh, linking and roll-up situations set up. So I've used the blue fish to represent Portland Community College, and we see that the blue fish is going to be able to eat the small fish of the textbook and program savings here, but because it's linked, um, these ones are linked to Portland Community College and then underneath those two there are linked to Columbia Gorge Community College. So that, that big fish will know to eat only those 
textbook savings and not the other ones. That way we know that our calculations will be represented accurately in the institutions table. Uh, next slide, please. So that was all very fast. Um, if you have questions, please be sure to ask them once we're through the rest of the presentation. Um, just wrapping up with some very quick things about Airtable pros and challenges. So as Daisy was mentioning before, it's really easy to get started. Uh, there's a lot of versatility, there's a lot of flexibility in the things that you can do, and it makes it very easy to start experimenting and see what happens. Um, some challenges, of course, are that we're, there's a sort of a balancing act between the way that you're designing the data and the way that you allow humans to work in it, uh, especially if you have multiple humans that are collaborating on the same table, because Airtable is not only a database, it's also an interface. So there's definitely some balance that needs to be considered there in terms of how everyone can work together. Um, and then of course, also capturing the entity relationships, which is not exclusive to, that's not, um, you know, no matter what system you work with, that's something that will be really helpful for you in designing the way that you work with your data. Uh, and some things that I'm excited for, which I unfortunately didn't have the time to talk about here, are some methods for future data input or automations. There's a, there's a lot of power in Airtable to produce automatic charts and to set up automatic um, calculations or linkings that can save a lot of human time once you're sure that you know what your system is. So it's a really great process for having a very human and experimental way of figuring out what you're gonna do. And then once you identify what that is, you can solidify it with uh, the table structure and the um, and automations. So I'll hand it back over to Amy now to wrap up and talk a little bit about reporting with Airtable. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so I just wanted to give a few examples of what I have been able to do with Airtable so much more easily this spring. Um, as Tracy was saying, like you can update in one place and the information will flow to flow through to the different programs and institutions that you're trying to report on or um, the overall program. So um, I got an email. Can you tell us how much Open Oregon Educational Resources money has gone to our college over the past biennium, including any encumbered amounts for grantees that are scheduled to be paid out? Total would be helpful. The amount specifically for grant projects would also be helpful. So yes, the answer is for the current biennium, your faculty at this college have received OER grants for 26 projects and the total award amount is $184,000. Your faculty have also received $10,000 in OER review stipends and $30,000 in course redesign sprint stipends all in one place, which is great. Let's do the next one, Abby. Thanks. I was contacted about presenting on our textbook affordability efforts to the board. Obviously, this is really important. <laughs> Would we have information back from you by late May in order to include those numbers in our report? And I was like, well, here's the preliminary information that's in the database right now. So I could easily say 111 individual faculty at your college have participated with Open Oregon Educational Resources by receiving a grant, taking a workshop, or joining a course redesign sprint since 2015. Your college has 77 redesigned courses as a result of this participation in the statewide program. 6,800 students have enrolled in the redesigned courses. Your faculty have received $61,000 of statewide funds. Your students have saved an estimated $774,000 as a result. And this represents a savings for students of $12.70 per statewide program dollar spent. So that's the impact for your college of the statewide OER program. And then I have one more example of reporting here. Preliminary data from 2015 to 19 past grants and professional development activities. So we're gonna do everything on the biennium in Oregon. So just bracketing aside the current biennium, which we're not really done quite with yet, but looking retrospectively, um, when I've been presenting to like our statewide OER steering committee and other affinity groups, I could say that for those first four years of our program, um, 1,390 faculty redesigned 904 courses for a cost of $1.2 million, and the estimated cumulative savings that resulted was $18.5 million, saved by 147,000 students, and that's about $15 in student savings per program dollar spent. Um, and I'm really focusing here on student savings because that's what um, the people that I'm reporting to in our statewide higher education agency and the legislature really care about, um, as Abby mentioned, you know, that's, that's not the be all and end all and we're not getting into like, 
you know, the sort of meaning behind what data you choose to collect and report on. But anyway, so that's what I've been able to do with Airtable. And now we want to hand it over to hear about a totally different solution that's happening um, with Viva. So please take it away, Sophie. Thanks, Amy. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sophie Rondeau, Viva's Assessment and E-Resources Program Analyst. And I'm co-presenting with Scott Ross, who is a self-employed software developer. And he was uh, the man uh, behind the magic of our MySQL database. Um, so we're going to share details about Viva's Open and Affordable Program the kind of data we are currently collecting, the impetus behind the development of our custom MySQL database, and the challenges associated with collecting course adoptions data, and then the vision for the future. So VIVA is Virginia's academic library consortium. Our members include 70 nonprofit academic libraries in Virginia, as well as the Library of Virginia. Viva has been around for over 25 years and has created significant cost savings through cooperative purchasing, resource sharing, and most recently through a new open and affordable course content program. Next slide, please. So the programs that are being served by our MySQL database are part of Viva's open and affordable course content initiatives. Some history about the Open and Affordable Program. The program began as a grassroots, grassroots movement across the state. Many institutions, including libraries, doing a range of open work. And after compelling statewide take up and requests from member libraries, Viva began a pilot program in 2016 with the Open Education Network. During the 2018-2020 biennium, the General Assembly awarded $600,000 each year to support an open and affordable program through Viva. And that's how my position and my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Westcott's position came to be. Next slide, please. So there are four open and affordable programs that involve data collection. Course material adoptions related to Viva's curriculum driven acquisitions program, which involves purchasing ebooks identified as course materials through bookstore lists. Adoptions through Viva's participation in the open education networks. Adoptions through Viva's faculty textbook portal, which includes ebooks available for purchase, ebooks already part of Viva's shared ebook collections, and OER. And faculty discover these materials through Viva's instance of Faculty Select. And lastly, but not leastly, course materials adopted, adapted, or created through the Viva Open Grants Program. Next slide, please. So Viva is collecting a variety of data associated with adoptions in the programs outlined in the previous slide. There is some data overlap among the programs, as well as some unique elements to each program. One of the central elements associated with the data is student cost avoidance. We use enrollment and the cost of textbook replaced to calculate this. However, there are other important variables to understanding the success of our programs. Since we have so many members, institution and institution types allow us to understand activity across those members. We gather instructor information for follow-up purposes. We maintain a controlled vocabulary of subjects that are assigned based on the department associated with the adoption. And this really helps us to understand the disciplines most served through the different programs. For example, if we notice a large number of history faculty are requesting ebooks available for purchase, we may use that information for our targeted grant call. We collect bibliographic information to reference the adoption when communicating with member libraries or faculty. And this also helps us understand the topics the materials may be addressing. We track the type of resource adopted and the cost to Viva. We collect the course name and number, 
which helps us to understand what academic levels the adoptions may be serving. An example of this is with the CDA, the Curriculum Driven Acquisitions Program. Course names and numbers have demonstrated that the ebooks are serving upper level undergraduate and graduate level courses. We track year and semester of adoptions and whether it is a first, repeat, or last adoption. And lastly, we track the program associated with the adoption, which helps us compare programs and the various needs they are serving. Next slide. So as one would expect, um, as our programs grew, so did our spreadsheets. Um, also, along the way, we established controlled lists for several data points so that we could generate charts easily with consistent data across the programs. And while it is possible to create drop down lists in a spreadsheet, they are a bit clunky to manage and use. The data became increasingly difficult to search, review, and manage, especially when tracking repeat adoptions. And the data for each program was maintained separately, and there was really no easy way to examine relationships across the programs without opening multiple spreadsheets and consolidating data points into separate spreadsheets. As a result, we started looking for a solution that would be relational, it would allow us to re retrieve data and generate reports more easily, eliminate redundant workflows, and be device agnostic since we have some PC users and some Mac users in our office. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to show you an example of one of the spreadsheets I've been working in to capture faculty portal adoptions data. Um, I had to zoom out and narrow many of the columns to get everything into the screenshot. You'll also see um, in the rectangle to the left, uh, several other worksheets on the bottom. And these are the controlled values used for data validation in the form of drop-down lists. I also use pivot tables extensively to create charts for reports, since we need to report at our, out at our quarterly committee meetings. And now I'm going to hand over the microphone to Scott, who will speak about our MySQL database. Oh, next slide. So um, we decided, so Viva had contracted with me to help them build this out. And so we started with sort of from their data and it sort of led me to just to propose a solution using WordPress. Uh, the reason we chose WordPress was opportunistic, I guess I would say. Uh, Viva's hosting provider already included WordPress as part of their hosting package. So it made it attractive in terms of the initial setup and sort of the ongoing expense. Uh, WordPress, however, is sort of designed to be a more generic or blog type of a, of a website. And so it, it doesn't fit everything, uh, but it does have a built-in MySQL database. And so, I was able to find some database oriented plugins that sort of turned that deployment into a much more of a database centric uh, website. And so basically what we've stood up is a standalone website that can run uh, an application across a MySQL, MySQL, uh, MySQL database. Um, WordPress also provides a nice academic uh, administration, administrative interface. And that makes uh, the end result a little bit more manageable and than a, deploying a full blown large scale solution. The objective here was really to build out basic functionality and sort of replicate or replace uh, the functionality that Sophie was using her multi spreadsheet uh, process to, to handle her data. Most uh, more robust solutions are certainly possible, but these are gonna probably involve uh, higher upfront costs and, and probably longer development time and probably also require uh, greater level of staff expertise can manage it. Um, it's, I've described here a couple of the plugins that we're using. These were uh, purchase plugins, WP Data Tables and Formaker Pro were, were the only two that we actually had to buy. Uh, there were, there's a large uh, universe of uh, available plugins for WordPress. Uh, some of them deal with the database, uh, but, but these were two that we actually purchased because we needed some of the functionality that was there. Next slide. So, 
one of the things that we did was we used the Formaker Pro to build out um, an adoptions form. The, the database itself supports um, bulk uploads. And so we can actually load in all of the data at once when we're, when we're ready to load in large blocks of data. But the, the process that they usually engage in involves one, two, five adoptions a day. And so having a form that they can actually use to submit that data in uh, was part of their, their workflow. Um, so we built this form using the Formaker Pro plugin. Data, validate, data validation and storage are sort of handled by the plugin once it's configured. And so there's not a lot of uh, handholding needs to happen. It'll prevent you from making mistakes and it'll tell you where things are required. Um, choices for many of the drop-down select fields are, are controlled. And so uh, these, are, these are handled by smaller tables and the, the controlled field tables can also be managed independently. We'll see on the next slide. So I set up some, some small forms. Uh, you can see here the one that's, that's highlighted is sort of the grants table, uh, but Sophie or the staff can go in and uh, add in new grants as needed. And then those grants will show up as options in the adoption form. So if they add faculty, if they add institutions, they could be a bulk, load, a bulk loaded, or they could just be added individually, uh, modified through these forms. Um, these are all sort of directly connected to the database itself. And so it gives them a way to, um, to manage and, and handle the, the options as their future needs might change or as the services that they're providing can change. They could add in uh, additional types or additional um, ways of accessing the data. So next, next slide. This is a quick, uh, a quick screenshot of what the view and export function looks like. So we built a page that sort of summarizes all of the data. Uh, the data records are, are all kept now in the database in, in MySQL tables uh, and they're linked together so that the the representation of the data itself can be surfaced. So the name of the institution isn't actually stored in the data records, the institution identifier is. Then when you build a viewer and export, it actually shows you the name. Um, the spreadsheets, uh, the spreadsheets, and, and this, is, this is something I actually spoke with Sophie about, spreadsheets and the applications that sort of surround them are widely accepted and get used for a reason. And, and it was interesting to hear Amy talk about that she's very comfortable with spreadsheets. People are comfortable with them they, and they find them a, a, a great way to increase the productivity. And so having the ability to export the data from the database out to a spreadsheet, whether it's a full export or just a partial export that's been filtered, um, allows Sophie or the staff there to, to generate transient spreadsheets or just subsets of the data and then chart or, or use that as a, as a different, um, you know, as a different product from this without having to maintain everything in the spreadsheet. So Spreadsheet can be used more like a transient tool rather than as a core component of how the data is managed. So next slide. So one of the things that the WP Data Tables plugin also has built into it is the ability to chart. And so this slide really just sort of shows a, uh, what they call a linked chart. So if I were, if, if this was a live demo, I could go in and apply filters to the institution names or to the types of data that we're representing and the chart at the top part of the page would be automatically refreshed. So I can get a live sort of view of what my filtered data looks like. And so I can subset the data in any way that I want to. I can export that subset or I could chart the subset and have a live view of it um, here portrayed on the, on, the, um, on the screen. So that's, that's all I've got um, in terms of the back end and what we've actually constructed. And I'm gonna turn this back to Sophie. So I wanted to share uh, with you another part of the process that the database does not address. And this might be one you're already familiar with, um, but that is a critical uh, piece of program assessment. And I chose to title this slide, The Dilemma of Data Collection, because it is a significant challenge that we are still working out. And as the programs grow, the challenge becomes even more significant. So we collect data for each uh, use of a resource in a course. The resource could be used in multiple sections and by more than one faculty member. And as we know, a number of factors may determine when a course is offered, such as reaching minimum enrollment or the offering is during a biannual cycle. So the desire to capture continued use of the course materials is an important part of that story because it impacts the return on investment 
And it is a significant undertaking to organize and communicate with faculty. What's more, it's often not straightforward. And this is what I'm gonna illustrate. I'd like to share the following communication, which you see on the slide. This is a real communication I had with a faculty member who adopted a resource through the faculty portal. So the email reads, dear faculty member, our records indicate that during the spring 2020 semester, you adopted the following ebook through the portal. Would you please let me know if you have used or plan to use the resource and subsequent offerings of the course and the number of students enrolled or the anticipated enrollment? I'm collecting this data to determine ongoing student savings associated with the adoption through the platform. And here's a response, the response I got. Sophie, I have used this book in older editions for a number of semesters. The course is being revised by our faculty lead. Until I see the outline, I cannot be sure if this will remain the textbook for the course in the future. I know this is not helpful for your statistics, but it is the best I can do for now, I believe. So in this case, thankfully, the faculty member responded, which isn't always the case, but unfortunately was unable to provide clear direction related to future of the resource due to considerations outside of their control. Further follow-up will be required at a later time and careful note-taking to record the situation so that I have a reference for future correspondence. All of this is a significant time commitment and presents assessment sustainability challenges. Next slide. But I don't wanna leave our part of the presentation on a downward note. So I'd like to share a vision for our future database and how it will further assist us in doing program assessment, such as the dilemma I presented to you just a moment ago. Um, I will say that in a conversation with Scott, I was assured the vision I outlined in this slide is achievable, albeit with resources. And my vision is that our future database will be equipped to automate the data collection process. Additionally, it will work interoperably with other platforms to reduce and eliminate duplicate data entry. And lastly, the database will expose select data points using a public interface that can be queried. And this will make it easier for our member libraries to use our data to tell the stories they need to tell on their camp campuses. So thanks for your attention. And now I'm going to pass it over to the Open Education Network. Great. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dave Ernst. I am uh, with the Open Education Network. And um, I'm going to be talking about our Open Education uh, data dashboard. Thank you. Um, one thing I want to point out right away is that um, what I'm going to be talking about is a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit of a, a, a different problem we're trying to solve and that, you know, with local, local open education efforts, um, I think, um, you know, systems that are built are, are built to, to manage the data and processes for those programs. What the data dashboard is, is a little different in that the programs that we're trying to manage, help members manage data for are not ours. And so that means that we're, we're trying to build something that will help um, to we currently have 239 members in the OEN. So we're trying to meet the needs of 239 different programs or different um, open education um, shops and it might even have multiple programs so it's a it's a little bit of a different problem space um, but it is a little bit it is it is important as you'll see as we go along in both the design and what maybe we hope we can do with it which i'll, I'll get to in the end so abby thank you so um a little bit of history the open education network started in 2014 and it started more, um, so it, it started as an initiative focused on our workshop and focused on collecting reviews as part of a, a strategy to, to, to engage faculty. And so in 2014, I, start, I started the process of collecting reviews with the members at the time. And at the time, there were only 10 or so members, maybe. Um, and I used a number of different technologies all strung together um qualtrics was one which is a survey software i used an api to tap into that and pull data into spreadsheets but i want to point out my goal here was not to manage the data 
for members programs. My mem my pro mine was to manage the process, which Sophie just pointed out um, in her second to last slide there. There's a different, there's two kind of challenges in this space, which well, at least two, but two big ones. One is the data management, like collecting, managing data, reporting off the data, all that. One is the process of collecting it, which is oftentimes the most laborious process. So I wasn't trying to manage anyone's data. I really just wanted to help collect the reviews and collect the survey data. And then I immediately turned around, sent all that data to our members on a spreadsheet and let them do whatever they needed to do with it. It wasn't so much of interest to me. We did want to collect the reviews that were written because those got posted in the open textbook library and um, that continues today. So that's all started in 2014. And um, it, it, uh, it became overwhelming pretty quick, especially as the network grew. And um, it, it became a almost full-time job for me running these things, managing it. And what they did, again, what it did is manage the process. Qualtrics sent out communications to faculty saying, hey, would you write a review? Or, hey, would you complete this survey? And then it collected those and it sent out reminders and so on. Anyway, so eventually um, we created uh, the data dashboard, which exists today uh, that many of you may have used, but it is, it is basically designed to help manage the workshop review process, not necessarily the data, Con the data contained in that, that you need for your programs. It was really built to create a, a solution for the process management, inviting faculty to workshops, sending out invitations to write a review, reminding people to write a review, um, collecting that data, collecting the survey data, and then, and then having it for you to use however you want. It was not, it's not collecting adoptions or enrollments or anything else like that. So. Um, so that was developed just a few years ago, and um, in 2021, uh, specifically next week, we're going to be releasing the, the, the 2.0, I guess we'll call it, the, the Open Education um, Data Dashboard, which I want to talk about here today. Thanks, Abby. So um, I'm going to actually kind of walk through screenshots of what it looks like and give, I hope that this will be the best way to give you an idea of the functionality. I want to point out the four tabs along the top just under where it says, yep, thank you. Thanks, Abby. Under the State College System OEM dashboard, programs, activity requests, and reports and settings. I'm not going to look at settings. That's just technical settings, but I want to start with programs here. So if we were to, so this is a list on this page, you see all the programs. Um, that that you have created and run. And you can define that any way you want. Again, to meet the needs of 239 members, we have to make it as flexible as possible. So we are, this new data dashboard is meant to both help with process and with data management. Okay, so um, in this example, I am an administrator at the state college system. That's a system. And so I have uh, three institutions within my system Alpha University, Beta University, and Gamma University. Uh, yeah, I know, really creative. So um, they. So what I'm doing is I am looking at my programs. This top, the top section here, where it says State College System Programs. Those are my programs. Those are things I created because they are run through the State College System. But there are also programs being run by the institutions. Uh, within the system. And those are the other programs on the bottom. You see that one run by Alpha University, the faculty, faculty champions one. So one of the goals of this new dashboard is to help systems and consortia work better with the institutions within them. So you saw two examples today, um, Amy and Sophie talking about, the, they are good examples of statewide systems and consortia that are working super, super closely with their uh, members with the institutions within their organizations or within their states. So we want to facilitate that by helping um, uh, helping with those communications and workflows. Okay, so if we were to create a new program, so I would be clicking on that prog add program button there. Go ahead. There we go. We can create a new program and let's say we want to, um, a program is really just a group of instructors. Okay, that's, and you can define what the program is, however you like. You can name the program. You could put a default cost per person in here. I just put $1,000 as an example. 
You can always change that on an individual um, participant basis, but as a default, you can describe what the program is, and then you can tag this program. This is one way that we are trying to attempt to meet more programs needs. Like I said, we're designing to meet the needs of 239 programs. Um, we've met with many, many members to talk about their programs, what data they need, all this. And we couldn't program all the specific needs into this, but we thought that by tagging, adding tags to certain elements that we could give it the flexibility to allow you to structure it for your own program. So for instance, the tag I hear, have here uh, is, I can't read it, it's actually too small for me. Is it a member funded, I think it says. So I'm a state system, it's a, I don't know, there's members of the system and they funded it. Maybe at an institution level, you wanna keep track of which programs the, 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 the uh, provost funded so that you can report out on that later to the provost. Hey, here are all the things that you funded. Maybe there are ones that you, um, uh, programs that, um, uh, you specifically want to follow up with. So tag it with uh, a follow-up tag, hey, whatever, however you want to structure it. Um, and so, um, uh, the, so you can create a new program and go ahead, please. Thank you. And then you can, and then click through a couple more. You can add people to it um, the same way the current dashboard works. You can just, you can, if you want to paste uh, emails and names in here, go ahead. Abby, and then it'll just add them in. And so you can very quickly create that. You can also create, so um, you can also, if you have an event associated with this, go ahead, one more click, please, Abby. Um, you can see the column there that says events and event and workshop. So if you want to associate an event or workshop with this group, so maybe it's a grant, a grant program, maybe it's a, and, and there's no event really, it's not a workshop, it's not a, I don't know what, but that's fine, you don't need, it's, we're not talking about, uh, a, a program can be just a program, a group of people. But if you want a workshop associated with it, you can add one by clicking in that column, go ahead and advance please Abby. And you can add um, a workshop or an event to it. And faculty can come and register for that workshop or event. And, and be added to the group as they register, okay? So they can be self-add, they can add themselves. And this will create, go ahead, Abby, please. And this will create a, um, one more, a registration page that will, um, um, faculty can go to and, and sign up. One more, please. There we go, there's a the registration page that it automatically creates for you. So the current dashboard does exactly this piece as well. But the difference is we're not structuring things around events anymore. We're structuring things around programs. You can add an event to it, but the, the main structure of the data is now programmatic. It's now whatever kind of program you want, not just necessarily workshop programs. Okay, next, Abby, thank you. Um, so um, quickly, I guess I'll look at the, um, we can click on the activity requests tab there. Uh, the next main section, yep and then advance that slide. And so what an activity request is, um, is right now we have two different requests you can make. And this is a request of instructors. So the system will actually, as I talked about, it, it also manages process, not data, not just data. So it manages communications with, with participants of, pro, of programs. So if you say you wanna create a new activity and you click on that, go ahead, Abby. You can either say a textbook review or an adoption and enrollment update. So if you, you're, you're asking, you're making a request, okay? So this one happens to be a textbook review. And so um, we can kind of click through some of this. You can hear all the fields. You can structure the communications however you want. You can write the email to them. You can determine the delivery date that it goes out to them, okay? You can set up reminders if you want to, and again, structure the, the email for that, just to remind them, hey, have you written this review yet, so on. And you can also build your own survey so that um, if you want to, oftentimes with the program, you want to follow up with a survey, you can do that too by adding questions from a question bank that we will be adding more and more questions as people um, request them. And then last but not least, 
you can decide who it's going to go out to. And um, this is just a quick look at um, how to do that. But you can you can edit, you can you can filter all of your programs, all of the all of the instructors within the programs, and kind of come up with the group that that you want. Okay. So you now I've created a new activity. It's going to go out. The deadline for is, for is uh, July 27th. Blah blah blah. So you now have a kind of an active thing out there, a request that's out there to instructors, and they are hopefully going to respond to you. And and the data will end up in the dashboard when you're all done. Um, one other feature you notice in the upper right, you see the find faculty. Um, at any time, go ahead, Abby. You can just pull up a list of faculty, search for them. We're going to look at Miguel. Go ahead. It'll pull up the details about that instructor, um, including all of the programs they've been involved with. Again, a tag. So maybe this is a possible faculty champion. I want to keep track of all them. I'm going to take it as that. Or maybe um, whatever. However you want to structure your um, uh, information and data, you can add a tag to it. The institution they're from, the, um, uh, the department that they're from, go ahead, Abby. All the activity requests you've made of that instructor, and I'm sorry, I don't have screenshots for the last little tabs here, but the completed reviews that they have and adoptions that they've made. And so, um, and um, yeah, and keep track of when they were last contacted because that's a, that may be of interest when you're emailing them. Um, you don't want to inundate them. If they were just emailed last, last week, um, you don't may not want to bother them again. So that's the idea be behind that. So you have control at kind of the individual instructor level. Um, all right, let's go one more. And then, um, and then the, the last tab we're going to just, I just have one slide on here, our reports. Yep, so let's go there. And this just shows one small screen of the reports that we're building right now that we have um, created it by student savings, by institution. If you're a, if you're a system or consortia, you might look at it by institution, um, by program, by subject area, by the, if you have workshops, by um, term, by adoption, by so on. All these different kind of structures of data, slices of them. Um, we can not only give you the raw data, but also um, we can, we're working on graphs. It's not too difficult to do of certain structures of data. Um, so, um, and then I guess, let's see, and I'm sorry, this is just a real small snapshot of it, but I'm gonna keep moving. And again, this will be available starting um, we're going to close things down next week, the, the existing dashboard to do the, the move. We will make sure that all of your data that you currently have, if you're a current user of the data dashboard, if, um, if you're an OEM member that uses that, all of that data will be moved to this new dashboard. Um, we will start training the following week and there'll be lots of support materials provided. Um, and um, one more. Um, and one, one feature that we are working on right now is kind of the next phase is the ability to, pass, to allow you to provide, uh, to create your own data reports. So actually kind of have more direct access to the data table so that you can build your own. Um, again, and, uh, our goal, it, it's, it's always a struggle to build an application that meets the needs of many because it, it, it's, it always runs the risk of being so vanilla that it meets the needs of nobody. And so we have to try to build in as much flexibility as we can, but at the same time uh, to be able to, we have to meet common needs. We can't meet, we can't build features in that meet everyone's needs. It would be overwhelming. So we're building in the things like the tags to allow you to create your own structure and this kind of um, the functionality that will come out soon, which is the ability for you to more directly build your own reports that you can kind of keep drawing on and coming back to, okay? Um, I want to throw out one other thing that's a benefit here, and that this is when I said this, this is a little bit of a different animal because this is intended to be a solution for the whole network and for higher education more generally. And so I was asked yesterday the question in this session, hey, has adoption of OER increased during COVID? And I certainly had to say, I have no idea. 
Uh, I don't know anyone who has that data. You might have it for your own institution. You might have it for your own consortium, maybe, I don't know. Um, but those larger questions, those kinds of larger questions are going to be easier for us as a community to answer if we have kind of a collective space where we're keeping our data and we're tracking our data. We'll be able to see increases in adoptions. We'll be able to see a, a total of savings, for instance. We'll be able to um, answer questions like what subjects have the most adoptions. We don't have that data right now. We can look at traffic in the open textbook library, but we can't look specifically at confirmed adoptions. I should mention for the first two or three years of the open textbook network, when it was called that, I did collect by hand from members um, adoption data and we reported out as a network. That was when we had a, a, a reasonable number of members where I could do it by hand. Um, uh, we're beyond that now. So it, it would be really exciting to be able to say that as a community, here's how much as, for instance, as one data point, savings, we're saving students at, you know, um, for open education. Um, it would be really exciting in the open textbook library, when you look at a book record, to be able to see this book has been, is being used at Purdue or at Virginia State or at, blah, 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 right? Um, we've heard that, that's been a feature request for so long, but we need the data, the adoption data to be able to do that. Um, instructors trust their peers, right? So to be able to see that specifically would be really, really powerful. And we're hoping that this dashboard will then provide that more global data that we can kind of then share back out and, and leverage for the good of everybody. So I, I wanted to point that out, that that's one potential layer of benefit to this if, if um, we can get enough users using it is we can all kind of collectively help each other um, answer some larger questions. So, all right, that's all I have. I think we may have met our goal of having 20 minutes left. Thank you. Indeed, you did make that goal of having 20 minutes left. So uh, please feel free to drop questions for our panelists in the Q&A, and I'm more than willing to wait awkwardly in silence while they come in. All right, we have a question from Justin asking, does anyone use a mailing list feature to track faculty responses to outreach like MailChimp? It's a really good question. And um, I actually was feeling like if I could talk to like a, um, you know, like someone who has a fundraising database, like there's some qualities in common with the kind of communication that I sometimes do. Um, but um, I'm not sure if you noticed when Tracy was showing the Open Oregon Educational Resources um, Airtable data tracker, there's a um, table for faculty and it has, um, you know, the information that I need to do um, a mail merge there. So it has first and last names separated. It has the email address, the institution. It has a field for email status. So um, like after my first mail merge to 1200 people, I got immediately 100 bounces of people that had separated from their institution for whatever reason. So I marked all of those people do not email. Um, and so you know, I was able to export information from Airtable into a spreadsheet and do a mail merge, which is a really useful thing like if you ever get a mass email that says dear amy and it's like how do they know my first name it's it's a mail merge <laughs> that does that um so i could ask individualized questions based on what people had done and what information i already had um, but then we had a new call for oer grant proposals come out um 
like a few weeks after that mail merge process was done. And so then I had like this giant list of who it's okay to email, like whose email address is working. So then I was able to send that call for grant proposals out to like a thousand people um, in a way that was like way more sort of targeted than what I had been able to do in the past. So um, to answer your question, I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of like using some of Airtable's functionality to meet the needs without having like a specific program like MailChimp, but I'd be curious about what the other folks would say to that. I, I would say that I Qualtrics again is what I used early on and it did exactly that kind of tracking which was super, super useful. So it's not necessarily Qualtrics isn't a mailing list like MailChimp kind of thing, but it's a it's survey software. If you have access to it, it's an amazing communication tool and it does track exactly that and it will it track, yeah, it tracks responses. It will send out reminders only to those people who didn't reply, not bug the people who already did. And it'll also track, as Amy pointed out, like when you do those mass ma mailings, you end up with a whole bunch of them that bounce. And it will also track that. It was a really, really nice tool. I'll add that um, in the in the dashboard that that we've built. There, I didn't show this. There are lots of pieces I didn't show, but there, there is a place for each inquiry that you make for every activity request you make. You can look to see who's responded and who hasn't responded in, in the kind of way I think you're, you're asking about. I just want to add one more thing to that, that like in terms of faculty participation, Open Oregon does like a lot of different kinds of things. Um, and so if, if like someone wrote me an email and I was like, how do I know them again? You know, it was like, oh, let me see if they did a 2019 course redesign sprint by opening that spreadsheet. And then maybe they were in like the 2016 grant cohort. So I'll open that spreadsheet and look for their name there. Whereas in Airtable, it is actually possible to understand faculty participation over time, like across the different programs. Cause it's really common for someone to, you know, do an OEN review workshop, and then they get a grant to adopt the book that they reviewed, and then they get another grant to like make some ancillaries for the course that they had previously redesigned, right? Like that's that's great. That's not double dipping. That's people like getting involved and doing continuous improvement on their courses. And so to be able to sort of um, slice through the data in that way um, by following a person is also really um, interesting and sort of related to what Justin was um, asking about, like how faculty respond to different outreach efforts. There was a question earlier in the chat about how Airtable might compare to Microsoft Project and Planner Amp. And Amy, you might be able to speak to that with your like pre-testing a bunch of stuff. No? That's actually one that I didn't test. <laughs> that in itself is an answer. And Justin, I'm seeing your chat about using a um, CRM and Airtable to track um, faculty participation. I wish we had connected sooner <laughs> so you could have been on this panel because it sounds like um, you're using Airtable in really interesting ways. Um, Abby's mentioning the Open Oregon um, resource tracker, um, which is basically a Google form that dumps into a spreadsheet. And then Tamara Marnell, who was a librarian at Central Oregon Community College, um, made a way for it to present as a table on our WordPress website by um, developing a little plugin for us to be able to do that. So that's like a totally unique um, list of adoptions in Oregon um, and a really nice complement to the kind of data set that Dave mentioned, which is like which open textbook library textbooks have been adopted where, right? I think that would also be really interesting and complementary and unique data to be able to access. One thing that Viva is looking at doing related to um, 
adoptions and where and for what courses. Um, like some other consortium, we have an OER Commons microsite. It's, it's known as Viva Open. And one thing we're looking at doing with our microsite is developing a hub where we um, add course alignment tags to OER that have been adopted at our member institutions. Um, and we know those adoptions through the OEN program so we can make those connections. So it's, it's a fun way to make connections across our programs and to use our microsite to be able to share that out with the larger community. Another nice thing about those course alignment tags is um, they, they have uh, filters and so on in the microsite that allow uh, users to essentially filter by institution and then it'll give them those particular um, disciplines and then right to the course level. So it's um, something that uh, I hope to build out. It's gonna take some time, it's a big undertaking, but it's one way of doing sort of similarly to what Amy's been doing with her, her table and, and sharing adoptions information. I'll add to that, that we were really inspired by how Viva is trying to connect instructors across the state with their, um, through their courses and, and as I teach similar courses. And um, we're hoping to use the data in the dashboard in the dashboard in a similar way. If we know what textbook, if, if it's a textbook, if we know what textbook they've adopted, we already have those textbooks categorized by academic area in the library. So we already we, we can already kind of structure those conversations we can already um structure and and put together faculty if we get to that point if there's interest in that we're putting together faculty who have who are teaching in similar content areas so we thought that was a great idea One other thing, I just wanted to kind of make an observation that um, all three of the um, solutions that were presented today did involve help from someone who's like a professional database person. And what I discovered when I was like trying to like experiment with different tools and even the ones that seem to be sort of self-help like Airtable, um, you know, for me, um, with my level of database knowledge, which is really minimal. Um, it, it really wasn't totally a DIY thing for the complexity of what I'm trying to do. And when I was talking to open ed program managers, you know, like people on the listservs or, you know, colleagues or whatever, people understand exactly what I'm trying to track and why, but don't necessarily have like really um, great expertise um, with database structure and design. And then I would start talking with database people. Like I called a friend who is a retired database manager at UC Berkeley. And when I was talking to Tracy, it's like, okay, they really understand the database structure and design piece um, so much more than I do. But they're like, okay, what's a program? What's a project? What's a faculty member? What's a course? You know, all of those definitions. And I think in some ways it's really helpful, like you saw um, on Tracy's slides, um, how she was able to really organize the information based on relationships and um, making all of that implicit knowledge more like something that's here, here it is in a picture and it's all drawn out um, was actually really helpful. And we're still discovering that there are implicit relationships that aren't reflected yet in the database structure. And we're finding um, at times like, oh, we do need to add another table to show those other relationships to make these things talk to these other things. So um, just to say like for folks that might be thinking like, great, I'll just get a free air table and see how far I can get. I just wanna kind of normalize that like, that for me, there was only so far that I could get on my own without getting some help. Um, but, you know, once we have a template that is shareable right now, it's not quite at that point, um, but, you know, we'll be obviously happy to do that. And then other people will have more of a starting point.
I'd just like to add, Amy, I love that you brought up the fact that you don't always know what data you need or what connections need to be fleshed out of something. Uh, we've recently found in our OER program that the sort of hidden connections between people are mostly the programs for our Center for Learning and Teaching they've been involved in, where all of a sudden there's six people applying for OER grants that were all in the team-based learning cohort last year because they know each other and they're connecting about these different ways of teaching. So tracking that sort of potential uh, contacts through other related institutional initiatives is something we've been trying to get into, but it's very difficult because then all of a sudden you have a data set that you aren't controlling and you don't necessarily have access to that requires reaching out to another group. And I think that's something that is going to be tough for a lot of people. For example, getting student enrollment numbers from your bookstore to actually put that into a table is going to take time, depending on how easy it is to get that information. And uh, I love the chat, by the way. You guys are just making all the connections in the world. Wonderful job. Yeah, there's a lot of great connections happening in the chat. Any final questions, folks? Well, I need to say a big thank you to all of the co-presenters on this panelist because I was the one who was like, I think people want to know about this. Um, so really big thank you to everyone for sharing, especially sharing things that aren't totally finished. I know that can feel a little delicate, um, but it's just been really great to learn about what other folks are doing and also to make new connections in the chat. So thanks so much, everybody. Yeah, not seeing any more questions coming in. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this session. So I would also like to thank our presenters for sharing their excellent expertise with us today. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us. And we want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks, including slides and transcripts. You can subscribe to our YouTube playlist to receive a notification. And uh, please feel free to keep this conversation going by joining us on Slack, which is at https colon slash slash OEN summit 21.slack.com. And um, if you're an OER OEN vendor, we hope you'll also continue the conversation in the OEN Google group. Thank you all so much for joining today's session.